podcast from the Coker Group that focuses on solutions to help healthcare organizations effectively navigate the changing healthcare industry landscape. Welcome back to another episode. You, this is your first time joining us for the podcast. My name is Mark Reibolt, and I'm the host of Coffee with Coker. And today's episode is titled Innovative Physician Compensation Models in a Dynamic Healthcare Environment. So we're talking about physician comp again, which is always a popular topic. And it's something we, as a firm, uh, spend a lot of our time doing and working on with clients. Today, we're joined by kind of a panel uh, talking about physician comp, and that panel includes uh, Justin Shambly, Stephen Ross, Alex Kirkland, and uh, Justin, Stephen, and Alex are are, uh, very experienced on um, this topic, and they have a lot of really good observations that they've kind of been talking about recently in some different uh, conference events and presentations, white papers, articles, etc., and so we thought it'd be a good idea just to have all three of them on and, and run through some of these different things we've been seeing and observing and are looking forward to seeing more of in the future. So I uh, hope you enjoy that. Um, I did want to just make a little bit of a uh, kind of a, a housekeeping note here. Um, we had a little bit of construction going on in the office when uh, we were recording this. And so maybe a little bit of background noise and you may pick up on that a little bit. And so we apologize for that, but hopefully it doesn't disrupt the uh, discussion too much. As always, we want to remind everyone, uh, you can listen to this podcast as well as all of our podcast episodes at coffeewithcoker.com. And you can follow us on social media, on Twitter, via LinkedIn. And you can also find all of our uh, content that we generate on the insights section uh, at cokergroup.com. And so with that, uh, we hope you enjoy this conversation with Justin, Stephen, and Alex. All right, well, welcome back to another episode. And uh, we want to welcome back our guests who are veterans for the podcast. So we have Justin Shambly, Alex Kirkland, and Stephen Ross, some of our team members that work here at Coker and and have a lot of expertise and and do a lot of work in the realm of physician compensation, which is what we're talking about today. As I mentioned in the intro, we're talking about innovative physician comp models. And this is kind of a a, another segment to a uh, previous episode that we did last year, a physician comp panel. It was very popular, a lot of positive feedback. And so we thought we'd circle back around and kind of continue that discussion a little bit. So Alex, Justin, Stephen, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Mark. Absolutely. And so let's dive right in. As as I mentioned, we're talking about physician compensation, specifically innovative models in what's become a um, continuously changing and dynamic healthcare market. So Justin, maybe I know you've spoken on this a good bit. And so maybe set the stage for us and what we're talking about in some of these innovative models. Yeah, thanks, Mark. It's great to be here with you all today. I have spoken on this topic a lot. It's a hot topic in the industry, and so uh, glad to be here talking about it as well. And for the sake of discussion today, I think we can boil the ocean down into three key categories in terms of of, of key dynamics relative to physician compensation, and that is value based healthcare, affordability, and then scalability. And and what I think we can do today is just sort of dive into each of those a little bit and talk about what they mean and how they are impacting physician compensation models going forward. I think that sounds great. And I think you said it well, we can kind of tee these, the, the three legs of the stool, if you will, up. And, um, and we'll probably be following up with some more specific content on each of these in the future, because there is a lot to digest here. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure to cover what we can today and then dive right and then dive deeper in future episodes. But well, let's start with the value-based healthcare piece. I mean, we've talked a lot about value-based healthcare in, in a lot of different contexts. Um, we know value-based healthcare is, is here and it's still evolving. It's still a lot of questions out there and, and, and the different forms it's taking on. But obviously this is something that is, you know, becoming much more acute of a topic as it relates to how we pay physicians and how comp models are formed and kind of how they are evolving. So you tell us a little bit more, I guess, and whoever, any of you guys want to jump in on this one, but how value-based healthcare is impacting physician comp models. Well, the first thing that I look to is this year, we saw the first payment adjustments from MACRA, which in my mind is the event that's making value-based care real to physician compensation because nearly all providers are going to have some form of Medicare fee-for-service revenue. And it's probably going to be a sizable form of your, your revenue stream. Now that at your performance to those Medicare patients is, is being reflected in your, your reimbursement. 
there was a lot of uh, participation to that too. So more than they had initially expected um, in the year. And the, the government, they made it easier to perform well in the first year. They eased some of the regulations and they'll stiffen over time. Um, we'll see that this next year, the year after, as payment adjustments continue to be made. But to me, telling us that we're, we're moving more in this direction and everyone is, is starting to acknowledge that more so. As a result, we see quality metrics trickle into physician compensation plans now. And it's not just you know here and there we see quality metrics. Um, on a lot of physician comp plans, we're seeing some percentage of their compensation carved out for those quality metrics. That's right. Yeah, one one interesting thing when you bring up the uh, the macro payments that just occurred, I think ninety three percent of physicians who participated received a positive payment adjustment, which in my mind tells you two things. Number one, there's a lot of physicians involved. Number two, it says that the regulations were pretty limited in that first year, which makes sense to get individuals or physicians involved. Yet, I think if we really want to use that program to effectuate change in the healthcare industry. We're going to have to anti uh, ratchet up the the quality metrics, and and I think the other key dynamic is, well, the maximum payment adjustment I saw was was one point eight eight percent relative to the program. That's not what the majority of physicians experience. They experience something much more uh, negligible, and thus, even in that regard, if we want physicians to, to to participate, we've got to make it worth their while, and so, or or at least weed out the ones who are highly uh, high quality versus the ones who aren't and, and differentiate economics that way. Yeah. And I expect that will change. You'll see more physicians on the higher swings of upward payments as regulations stiffen. And there's an opportunity now to show higher value through, through your sure. performance metric. And I think many organizations, though, perhaps Medicare has led the charge, so to speak, uh, you know, the other commercial payers, managed care payers are, are closely on their heels following suit in terms of even, uh, you know, their managed care negotiations with health systems and how some of those rights are being tied to value-based um, uh, performance outcomes, care coordination, quality, et cetera. And so, you know, I think the, this whole environment is going to continue to pick up stream, uh, steam, rather, and we're going to see this um, more and more in the days ahead in yeah. terms of um, physician compensation being attached to outcomes, quality, yeah. that kind of thing that we're seeing in macro. I think you know two other quick points on that, uh, one tied to macro and one tied to what, Stephen, you were mentioning, and, and that is one of the other interesting tidbits that came out of all the macro payment data is rural practices and small practices mm-hmm. scored lower than the majority of, of other practices, which makes sense when you consider the lower level of resources that, that exist in the rural markets and the smaller practice markets. I know in my experience back in uh, late 2017, when, when uh, MIPS was really taking hold, we would still have clients that were, were not clear as to what MIPS was and to find out that they were actually eligible for incentive payment or potentially reductions in payment. Based on that, it was somewhat of an eye opener. And so uh, I I think we'll see those rural practices to some extent continue to struggle due to a lack of resources, but they also have to to pick up the game. And I think that speaks to one dynamic that we've seen relative to the whole value-based healthcare realm, and that is it is very much a local discussion in a local dynamic, meaning we have been in markets that have been inundated with value-based reimbursement, and that has really changed the financial and operational dynamics of that market in terms of how we compensate physicians, how we run physician practices. We've been in other markets where MIPS is the only thing that's going on, Mm -hmm. and thus, you know, how they adapt their practice is very different. Is it is that the only thing going on typically because because of those local local market dynamics, it's just not needed to do anything more? Or going back to your point, is it just a lack of resources or a lack of knowledge and information or capability? Or is there a disconnect there? I think it's a, a little bit of both. Uh, I think in, in some of those smaller markets, uh, it, or really in just certain markets, due to the dynamics of managed care in that market, or because it is a rural market, the payers just are not interested in pursuing that as much as in in other markets. So I think you have that dynamic going on where it's the payers are driving it. But then I also think in certain markets, you have health systems that just are not as progressive as others. And so they are not internally driving that ball forward and going to the payers and, and pushing for value-based reimbursement. Thus, uh, there's less activity there than than in other markets. That leads to one of the most important points in my mind, which is 
making sure that your physician compensation tied to these quality-based or value-based metrics is proportionate to the revenue streams coming in the door. Um, I've, I've worked with groups who have really tried to be progressive on quality metrics, and they've, they've put too much of their uh, emphasis, their compensation plans in that regard. And what happened was they got the, their desired outcomes. Quality scores went through the roof um, at the sacrifice of profit. And, you know, and you need profit to drive, drive your mission. Um, you know, volumes decreased. They were spending more, an inordinate amount of time with patients so that they could do the things that they were incentivized to do. So it's important to, to know how your uh, contracts are set up and, and to align your incentive structure um, proportionate to those, uh, those reimbursement structures. And I think it's incumbent on that point, Alex, that uh, leadership really have a, a long strategic view of where they want to go and that they're messaging that on down. And even physician leaders partnering with maybe administrators or hospital, uh, you know, CEOs and um, CFOs and, and so forth, uh, the, the upper ranks, in order to clearly articulate to everybody, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And success will look like X, Y, or Z. And when we get there, we'll celebrate and move forward. But uh, the organization's aligned in terms of the value, the revenue, the quality, the patient outcomes, et cetera. Yeah, I know one of the key questions that we get asked uh, when, when a, a potential client calls in looking for a change in comp structure, or one of the key drivers is, the desire to in, in implement performance or quality incentives into the model. And the first thing that I always ask is, what is your payer environment look like? Meaning, are you heavily pursuing value-based reimbursement or not? Because I think that really drives how much uh, we want to pursue that within the, the comp model redesign. And that doesn't mean that if, if the payers are pursuing it, we should do nothing. It just means that it may tamper how much that, w that or temper how much we want to pursue that so that we're not getting too far ahead. But I think, you know, truly tying this into the comp design process, what we find right now is we still have a heavy contingent of fee-for-service reimbursement that is being supplemented by value-based reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And so the key dynamic is now not necessarily how much you do, which is, is still very important. It's not only how much you do, but it is also how well you do how much you do. Meaning we've got to make sure that we find the right balance between volume and quality. And I think that's the whole idea of MIPS and what other payers are also trying to do as well is, is still drive, well, is still stay in this fee-for-service realm, but find the right balance to where we're not sacrificing quality at the, the expense of high volume or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we have clients that, to your point, are very much in a fee-for-service environment. And some of them are, hey, this has worked well for us. We're reticent to make change. And so they may not be as aware or adept to pursue some of these new payer models that can promote some new upsides and, yeah. and, and help them uh, recognize some incremental revenues in some ways. So that's one thing that we try to help our clients with um, as well, trying to have the right strategy to, to which payer models are we going to participate in. And that will have an impact on ultimately how that was going to flow down to physician compensation. Absolutely. Um, Alex, you alluded to a, a minute ago incentives and aligning incentives. Maybe if, if you guys, again, whoever wants to jump in on this, but walk us through kind of where we're at right now in terms of um, value-based care, value-based payment models, and how those line up with incentives when you're talking about physician comp. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll comment on that. And, and this is a hot button issue that I'll, I'll touch on that we've seen a lot of clients struggle with. And, and that is whether it's MIPS, whether it is participation in CIMs, whether it is other pay for performance programs, we do see value based dollars starting to come in the door. Oftentimes, health systems struggle with what to do with those. And when these dollars are very small, one of the things that, that we've seen occur is they view it as additional physician compensation. So let's say you're participating in a Blue Cross pay for performance program. Oh, we get $2,000 for a single physician coming in for his performance. And what they do is because it's small dollars, because it was tied to this respective physician, they just pass those dollars straight through to the doctor. What happens is that program swells. We've seen this happen a number of times that the program swells and, and the $2,000 turns into $40,000. And we've set this precedent of passing through these dollars. And that creates a problem. Number one, because it creates compliance issues because we haven't really factored that amount of compensation into the overall comp plan from a fair market value standpoint. But number two, if the whole idea is to replace 
fee for service dollars with fee for value dollars. And we've set a precedent of pushing through 100% of the fee for value dollars coming in the door. In essence, we're giving 100% of our reimbursement to physicians as compensation, which is problematic long term. And so what we've had to counsel organizations on is to view those dollars coming in as new forms of revenue, not pass throughs of physician compensation. And then to Alex's point earlier, make sure that their comp model is structured to drive those dollars no different than they have a worker of you based model, let's say, to drive the fee for service dollars. And so the key is view the new dollars as revenue, not compensation, and then structure the model to drive the revenue no different than you do on the fee for value side. And then you can service side. And then you can tie the those revenue, those additional revenue dollars over to whatever the quality metrics are, I presume. That's exactly correct. Is it too early to tell if the payments that have been received that could be tied to what we call value-based payments or that that form of compensation to be represented in the market data, the survey data that we've seen? I mean, is it has it been in place long enough, do you think, or is it kind of maybe a couple years out? Great question. Uh, it's something Alex and I were, were dealing with literally yesterday mm-hmm. on a, a project. And what we do find is some of the survey data is they're not necessarily breaking it out in the data tables, but in the intros to the surveys, they're speaking to how much of total cash compensation is tied to quality metrics or other things. One of the surveys that we we saw just the other day, large, and, and mind you, the sample size was not overly large, but it was indicating roughly 10% of compensation, of total cash compensation is tied to these quality metrics right now, really for all specialties. For all major specialties, primary care specialists and surgeons. Because historically, on the primary care side, you would expect to see a higher percentage um, allocated towards quality, value-based metrics, things of that nature. So when you're designing a compensation plan specific for surgeons, you may not expect to pay 10% towards those quality metrics. What we're seeing now in some of the survey data rep- reported is that, hey, they're, they're actually, they're modeling that in. And it could be, you know, that 10% amount um, as represented in some of the survey data. And I think a lot of that is driven by what can the physician influence in their practice, you know, that is really driving how, what percentage are you attaching as well as the, the total amount. And then specifically, how does that break down? Yeah. I I also think macro plays a big factor into this is now, you know, almost everybody's used to reporting on some quality metrics of some kind now, regardless of specialty. Yeah. And what I find is when we we use the phrase quality metrics sometimes that is used very liberally in today's market yeah. meaning uh, oftentimes it is more so process based measures versus true quality metri- measures when i think of quality i'm thinking of outcomes mm-hmm. right uh, versus process did you do this did you do that and i think in a lot of instances data capture is the challenge meaning we don't have the data right now to necessarily focus on outcomes based measures so we're going to focus on the process based measures hoping that it influences quality and so i think that just speaks very very quickly to how far we have to go in terms of truly having the data to focus on the things that truly drive quality and even be able to measure it so you can tie back all that's right to it. that's yeah. right and mm-hmm. what we've seen too if you go read you know the legislation it'll say it'll state in there how there's CMS's design goal is to incentivize or encourage the use of outcomes based measures in future years. Sure, They're going to yeah. continue to, you know, we talked about how regulations are going to stiffen. If you report six measures, it's going to get to the point where half of them have to be, you know, categorized as an outcome measure as opposed to a process measure. So that that design, that forethought is uh, is is in the works and we'll see that in future years. Well, I know we're going to spend we could spend a lot of time dissecting, you know, this value-based care and how it ties to comp alone just in and of itself. And I'm sure we will revisit. Let's jump ahead to the second stool or second leg of the stool, I should say, and talk about affordability. What do you mean there? Yeah, I'll kick this off and I'd love for Alex and and, uh, Stephen to add to it. But one of the things that we see is uh, health systems questioning whether they can continue to afford the compensation that they've been paying to physicians. And what I mean by that is if you look at survey data, and it doesn't really matter which survey you're looking at, all survey data has demonstrated increases year over year over the last five, six, seven years. And they're not necessarily dramatic increases. It's 2% here, 3% there, 4% here, et cetera. But when I'm in, in speaking on the subject, I ask audiences, how many have, have seen their reimbursement increases similar 
and how many have seen their expenses decrease in a similar manner? And most haven't. And so what you have is stagnant reimbursement or mm-hmm. declining reimbursement, increasing or stagnant expenses, but then increasing physician compensation. And that proves to be problematic in terms of can we afford to do what we are doing now long term? And I think so many organizations have, have uh, come to rely so heavily on survey data that they don't necessarily pay attention to the actual economics of their practice. And so what we have been counseling organizations to do is to, to see the market data as a starting point, but supplement that with perhaps what they're collecting per RVU and other key metrics so that then they are making sure that whatever they put into place is sustainable long-term. Yeah. Just to emphasize that, I, I love the surveys as a reference point mm. and I use them every day, but you know, you, you'll work with, there's, there's organizations out there that just live and die by them. And you can't do that because as Justin was just saying, over a period of time, there's a continued upward push of those conversion rates. And the, you know, you said that your reimbursement is, is not going that direct that way. You know, evidence of that is the CMS conversion factor over, a, you know, a five year or even longer period of time has stayed just about flat. So your reimbursement is, is not moving um, unless you're being progressive, go, you know, looking to some of these new models and finding new ways to recognize revenues. But you're, yet your compensation plans, you know, keep going that way if you're, you're tied to these surveys and the market-based percentiles. And I think compounding that point is a many compensation plans that we may, you know, be brought in to, to help with is it's not uncommon there to be kind of a stacking of compensation elements to mm-hmm. where there may be a work RVU-based model, but by the time then you add, you know, kind of the bonus, the incentives, the call, et cetera, when you really take a step back to look at the effective rate for work RVU, the TCC for work review that's being paid, then, you know, that raises some eyebrows and a lot of health systems just aren't aware that they're actually effectively paying at that level. And, uh, and that's what I think we see year over year being played out in that survey data. I think we see two phenomena occur in the market right now. Number one, a lot of organizations view the market data and, and specifically the compensation per RVU data as being the productivity incentive component of the model, whereas everything else should be in addition to. When in reality, the market data is total cash compensation per RVU. So it's whatever shows up on a physician's W-2, let's say. Which, which would, would include it, everything. That's yeah. right. That's right. So it's more than just clinical comp. And so if we're taking the survey data and then layering on top, as, as Stephen was saying, it creates a dynamic where we're paying a lot more than we think we're paying. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one challenge that we see. The other is that a lot of organizations feel like they have to update their comp structures based on the newest survey data every year. And that proves to be problematic as well, because once again, our reimbursement may not be increasing every year or our costs may not be decreasing. So just because the survey says that X percentile goes up 3% the next year, Does that mean we can afford the 3%? That's right. There's a lot of reactive market pressures Mm -hmm. embedded within those surveys. That's right. We wrote a white paper. This was actually about three or four years ago now, so it's a bit dated, but the principles still are 100% accurate and relevant to today's market. And that is, in our opinion, some of the increases that we see in survey data year over year are not as much driven by market pressures, but based on how the survey data is applied. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure we can we can post a link to that uh, Mm -hmm. white paper on this podcast, but it's a great read because it it speaks to how our application of survey data can end up increasing compensation in the surveys year over year. Well, really, it just creates a kind of a vicious cycle, right? And we're chasing our tail to a certain extent uh, in in the market each year. And, And I think Alex, it goes back to your point that the the data and the surveys only tell part of the story, right? You have to take each case into consideration and, and then, to, Stephen, to your point, all the different things that are being incorporated and are, quote unquote, stacked. But I mean, if you're thinking about this in the context of affordability and you're thinking about kind of approaching that model design question and, and Justin, to your point, you know, getting it, getting the model designed right the first time so you're not just kind of going through this cycle every year. Walk us through that a little bit in terms of you're going through the market design process and and how we're applying some of these uh, benchmarks. Yeah, sure. So I think 
the key is is that the design process is critical to having a, a fully functioning model going forward. And so we can't emphasize that enough. We we have have cleaned up so many models that you know economically even the, the the intent was was good yet due to structural issues it created unintended effects so structure is so important to having a sustainable model but steven was alluding to this a little bit earlier and and, and that is we really try to take a top down approach to pay meaning let's identify the key economics that we want to pay, whether that is on an hourly rate basis, a shift rate basis, if we're dealing with hospital-based specialties, or on an RVU basis, if we're dealing with uh, more ambulatory or surgical specialties who, who are in a position to generate work RVUs, let's define the rate per RVU, and then let's decide how we want to spend that in terms of work RVU production, compensation, quality incentives, et cetera, so that we know the sum of the parts are going to equal that rate that we're going to pay. And then let's be smart about how we set that rate to make sure that, number one, it's affordable today, but then also structurally we we design it to where it's affordable tomorrow as well, meaning uh, we're not necessarily marketing it, marking it to market, but Perhaps we are just reevaluating it every couple of years, or we're tying it to what we're collecting per RVU, things like that, so that then we are creating something that's sustainable. The other idea that, that we really like about this top-down approach to pay is it creates a structure that is adaptable to the market, meaning if your value-based reimbursement is increasing the market, we can easily adjust the levers without having to over overhaul the model. And that we won't jump there just yet, but that speaks to also the scalability dynamic, which is so important. And that is, can we create a model that can stand the test of time versus working for just this unique physician or just this unique market dynamic that we're experiencing? So so kind of the classic, you know, set the target of where you want to end up and then work your way back to fill in those different waypoints in terms of how to get there. That's right. Yeah. Well, why don't we why don't we do that? And uh, and again, this you know we could we could talk and we'll talk more about uh, affordability uh, later. But why don't we talk about scalability? Because you know I think it sounds like all of these these topics here are relevant, and so I want to make sure we kind of tie them together because I think they you can't talk about one without the other. So when you talk about scalability, you know what are some of the key factors driving that? I think from you know my perspective and interaction with clients, it's really um, a system seeking to achieve not only alignment with providers, um, but how to integrate across a continu- continuum of care and how to design a compensation model that really incentivizes and rewards that um, you know playing together as a team versus in a siloed approach. And um, you know I, I think we. We often talk internally about, uh, you know, it may be easier to manage a group if you're just really small, perhaps, you know, maybe a dozen, two, two dozen providers. It's a total different story when you get into maybe mul- multiple hundreds of providers within a, uh, under a single medical group model. And across and different specialties. Across different specialties and, yeah. where th- there's just a high degree where, where, where the system and the community really gets a lot of value from all the providers looking at care comprehensively across a continuum versus in their own specialty. And so, um, you know, one important aspect of scalability is uh, designing a model and an overall infrastructure in terms of the the governance process that really promotes this, you know, not only concept, but the realities of um, high quality outcomes across a continuum of providers as well. Which is so important because so far we've talked about the science aspect of physician compensation, sure. which is important. You got to know how to set the variables, the, the order of operations to, to structure the components and all that. But so much of um, dealing with physician compensation is an art mm-hmm. and the way that you effectuate that garner support within the physicians of your group is very important. And so if you're doing something in an objective manner, that's gaining support and getting their you know, physician feedback as you're doing that. It's it's going to only lend to the success of the model to help effectuate that, um, so that the people benefiting from it, the physicians, you know, have their voice in it. They want they want to you know be heard um, throughout this process and be partnered with, um, so that something's not being done to them, but that they're they're helping driving the decisions. So. And I think the the key dynamic we also have to see is moving away from what I would call the deal based approach to the physician enterprise based mm-hmm. approach. And what I mean by that is what we've seen a lot of health systems do is is their medical group or their physician enterprise grows through 
acquiring this four physician practice and this 12 physician practice and this eight physician practice. And then, yes, we bring some from outside of the market in. And if you don't ultimately fold all of these acquisitions into a cohesive comprehensive structure, you're going to be managing deals in infinitum, meaning, hey, this four physician group's model is expiring or contract is expiring. We got to go renegotiate that. And then this other group, and you never get to the point of having a true comprehensive medical group, which Mm -hmm. number one speaks to the scalability dynamic. I would much rather be working with a, as Stephen was articulating, a, a, a comp committee, a governance structure to manage a comp model that is applied to 400 physicians, let's say, versus spending all my time out negotiating onesie twosie deals with all these different doctors that are under the quote purview of the health system. And all probably with varying models in it with, with each one. Maybe. That's right. Yeah. They may have some, some similarities, but they all have their unique aspects. And, and so it's a mindset shift of moving from deals to a comprehensive structure. And I think it goes back to even the value-based healthcare dynamic. Let's say tomorrow, Medicare comes out with a new reg that substantially improve or increases the the value of value-based reimbursement within the Medicare reimbursement program. If we are working within a comprehensive structure with good comp governance, we can get that group together, decide what changes we need to make to our comp structure that then trickles down throughout the organization. If we're in the deal-based mindset, we're going to have to go out and renegotiate who knows how many deals mm-hmm. to effectuate that change there. And, and so uh, long term, scalability and the value based healthcare dynamic run hand in hand, meaning we can't scale up effectively and, and accomplish what we need to in the value based realm if we don't have a good structure in place to manage physician compensation. Yeah. And, and it may be kind of anecdotal at this point, but I know we could all provide our own subjective evidence showing that those organizations that do kind of what you're saying, Justin, manage the deals and, and, and basically trying to continuously manage these disparate pockets or groups or whatever, however it may be, the path to value or the ROI that these, that the systems ultimately achieve on these is typically pretty different from those that truly achieve what you're talking about, Stephen, this integration concept or this model of scalable, integrated, one unit, uh, one governance model, et cetera. And I think, uh, you know, it's just a trickle down effect from just being able to administer the plans internally to coordinate internally to message. I mean, there's a high cost of not being organized efficiently or effectively, um, starting with a a governance structure, whether that be a board, a a compensation committee, um, perhaps different elements off of that board to address maybe value what, uh, you know, what goals um, will we, what, what metrics will we target? Who will be in charge of that? What outcomes are we, you know, expected to achieve and so forth. And so having a clear understanding of what an effective governance structure can look like getting everyone on the same page, I think is very foundational. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, I'm going to throw this question out, but it's, it'll be, uh, you know, again, we could talk, for hours on this alone, we'll, we'll kind of use it to, to, I guess maybe it's a teaser for a follow-up discussion on this. But I, I think when we talk about scalability, anyone listening out there is going to say, well, yeah, of course we want scalability. And of course we want to operate more as an integrated enterprise and, and kind of move from alignment to integration. But how do they do that? Give us kind of the a high level preview of what are some of the steps? What does that look like? What is that pathway? And obviously we can drill down much more specifically on that and follow up discussions, follow up content, but, you know, tee that up for us because I got to think that's going to be a, a common question. Well, I guess within the governance process, I think about three main steps. One is the, the compensation committee who's, who's, who's administering the governance function of that. And then there needs to be a compensation plan or a, I'm sorry, a compensation policy. We need to have document our key tenants. You know, what do we want to reward? Uh, we want to make sure that our compensation philosophy is going to be equitable. It's going to be adaptable to change. Um, it'll be flexible per the strategic goals of our organization. And then finally, we need to have that documented within an actual compensation plan. Um, each one of these components, you know, can, can, is going to have, deserve its own conversation yeah. to delve into deeper. Yeah. And I think it's taking the organizational governance that should exist in any organization in terms of boards, committees, et cetera, and applying it to the comp structure. 
uh, we use the term compensation governance, which sounds a little bit nerdy to those who are not dealing with physician compensation every day, but it is a key component. And, and as, as Alex articulated, we've got to have these key tenets or key steps there to drive that philosophy. So once again, we're driving it at a corporate level versus with this practice, this practice, this practice individually. And, and the whole idea of the compensation committee is to bring physicians into the discussion, not necessarily the full decision-making process. We don't have to empower them to make all the decisions uh, because as a, a health system, uh, they, the health system wants to have ultimate control, but we want to have their, their opinion at the table to help drive those discussions that then they can take out to their constituents to uh, to make sure that they know th- that the constituents that is are, are well represented in compensation decisions. And then as Alex articulated, the policy, the whole idea of the policy is to establish the key tenets of the organization. When we develop compensation structures, what are we trying to accomplish? What are the key drivers and making sure that that's in place? And then of course the plan is taking some of those key documented points out of an employment agreement and putting them into a document that's controlled at the medical group level so that once again, it's easier to change things as needed versus going and updating untold numbers of employment agreements to effectuate small changes that need to be made. And I think from our experience, um, you, you know, I can say that a lot of organizations have many elements of these um, components in place, but perhaps there's, you know, one or two that they're strong on, for instance, on the policy side just alone. I mean, we we see that there's probably a dozen or so you know, policies that if an organization really thinks through to address, whether that be fair market value or where we're going to bring, um, you know, those those type of issues, whether it be where are we going to bring new providers, how do we set compensation, new guarantees, et cetera. There's probably about a dozen of those type that would then help maybe make the plan more robust that would eliminate a lot of kind of the pain points on the back end administration, the one-off exceptions, the deals, or, you know, just the the fighting fires from time to time. So really thinking through that well is important. And, um, you know, it's, it's good to see organizations move along that continuum to a more effective state as well. Well, to that point, I think we've all seen those organizations that they're, they're awesome at forming committees, right? They, they love to form committees and they have these, different committees for, you know, kind of everything, but whether or not there's substance and substantive action and authority behind those committees and the documentation and kind of their mission, what they're ultimately, how they're ultimately implementing whatever they're designed to do, you know, that can vary, obviously. And and I think the committee, we've seen plenty of organizations who have committees, comp committees, right. but just because you have the committee doesn't mean they're effective. And I think that's the key is not just having a governance structure, but having something that is truly effective. And, and, and so getting, once again, not to get into the weeds too much here, but the size of the committee makes a difference. I mean, we've been in organizations that have a comp committee that has 25 people on it. Mm-hmm. That can't, that, that size of committee can't make decisions. Yeah. And so the, the the structure of these things has to be appropriate as well to truly allow them to be successful in governing the compensation model. And I think on that point, Justin, is making sure that we, you've got key physician buy-in, meaning if, if, if we know up front that there will be a key physician who maybe is a loud voice or a, a strong influence, getting him a seat or her at the seat of the table will be very important in terms of getting him on board and, and kind of carry that banner and flag on down to the ranks. That's right. That's yeah. right. Good points. Well, um, this has been uh, extremely helpful for, I think, just uh, even at a high level um, to run through and, and kind of, um, as I mentioned before, we'll, we'll have opportunity to dive into much more detail on each of these three different things we talked about. And we'll make sure this episode has um, links to other information that we put out there on these things, because we have uh, we're seeing more of this and we are spending more and more time on these things as this this issue continues to develop and evolve. So thanks, guys, for coming back. And we'll look forward to diving in deeper in future episodes. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks.